Hello, it's Gail Bird here with Micah and Ink on Clay. My last video gave me some really interesting results with the Lumiere paints, but what you didn't see was a side effect of using just the mica powders and the alcohol inks with no Lumiere. The mica powder I was trying to cover up was peeking out through the ink, creating this amazing beetle-like texture and shine. And based on those results, I tried a whole batch of clay using mica powders on the raw clay, baking it, and painting with alcohol ink. And while I was at it, I also recorded the way I make my clay components in the first place. So first, you'll want to use something to work on, such as this 12-inch ceramic tile. And since I don't generally clean up after myself, I need to clean it up first before I do anything, which is just the backwards way to do anything. Um, alcohol ink dissolves polymer clay. So it's really helpful in cleanup. This is just paper towel and a, and a spray of the rubbing alcohol. So I use this Sculpey Primo Clay in white. It's really strong and it's great for jewelry components. Since we're coloring this later, we don't need to worry about contaminating white. So it's really perfect for those of us who aren't big on cleaning up after ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I have painfully weak hands. So this is me conditioning my clay. Cut off three slices of the Primo, which is half the block, and flatten the ends. I was using a tissue blade, but it's really not good for this kind of work. I actually went to the kitchen and took a solid steel knife for this use after this. Very, very slowly, you take those three pieces and run them through your pasta machine at the thickest setting. This machine was modified by Mona Kissel to be easier to use with clay, and I love it. Check the blog post for details and a link on where to buy your own. You want to fold over the resulting clay blob and run it through again, again moving very slowly. Polymer clay is really stiff out of the package and you have to condition it in order to use it. So by combining and pressing the clay together in this way, you'll get a nice soft conditioned sheet without too much effort. Um, I can do this and not have any pain and it's, it's great. Um, you really want to fold and roll through until the edges of the clay are no longer ragged and the sheet is quite pliable. I don't usually count how long this takes, but for you guys, I did, and this was 31 runs through the machine doubling over. Continue folding and rotating the sheet and running it back through the machine, and you'll find it starts getting much, much easier to do. You can see that it starts getting softer and um, more held together it's really it's, it's it's getting all the same texture rather than the crumbly bits that it was to start with you'll want to finish up by creating a sheet that's approximately the size of your texture sheet uh, it doesn't have to be perfect but um, you want to get as much of that texture sheet as possible as i told you in my last video and in the accompanying blog post, which had more details, this texture was carved out of material I hadn't previously used, but I really like how it came out, so I wanted to use it again. So my hands aren't strong, as I've mentioned, so to avoid injury, this is how I press clay with my sheets. First, lay down the sheet on the ceramic tile and set the texture stamp on top. Use a 16 ounce mallet to hammer the sheet into the clay. It actually works best if you start in the center, which I forgot here. Um, but do as I say, not as I do. The idea is to keep the hammer solid on impact. If you bounce the hammer, you might bounce the sheet and create a doubled impression. Um, Adam Savage on Tested just informed me that there is such a thing as a dead shot hammer that is designed not to bounce. So I'll be looking into that. But for now, these heavy mallets, they're, they're rubber. Um, they work just great and you can get them at any hardware store. I didn't get a perfect impression here, but that's okay, because perfect doesn't exist. Um, I'll be cutting out various shapes and re-rolling the clay several times until all the clay is gone, so instead of starting over, we just make use of the sections we like. 
I'm using Kemper cutters here, and they're really small, which isn't usual for me, but I wanted to, to try that beetle shape again, the beetle, the, the, the smallness. The plastic wrap is laid down before each cut to soften the cut edges and pulled up after to avoid squashing the top of the impression. I'm using a small piece of a broken ceramic tile to aid me in pushing down the cutters again to save my hands. When you've cut the shapes out of the usable parts of the sheet, you'll want to pull off the remainder and fold it to go back into the pasta machine and cre keep creating sheets and keep creating impressions and it just until the clay is gone. Now's the time to use that flexible blade to get the clay bits up off the ceramic. About halfway through my clay, I realized that since I was planning to squash down the edges of my components with my fingers, I didn't need the plastic wrap, so I just used the cutters as is and used my hands to flatten the edges a bit. Some of them I even squashed right onto the filigree I wanted to, uh, to back them with. Now comes the experiment. I put about half of the clay pieces onto some metal filigree, and the other half I just left plain as they were. Um, then I got out my mica powders. I tried some primary elements at first, but they were too glittery for me, too coarse for what I wanted to do. So I switched to Perfect Pearls for this first coat. I wanted to saturate the recesses of the impressions with the metallic powder, not just the, the highlights. So I used a brush for the first stage. Then I switched to my pan pastels and the soft tools that come with it just to add a contrasting metal color to the highlights. This step was probably not entirely necessary, but I did it anyway. You can probably skip it. You'll want to take the whole ceramic tile to your oven and cover it with an aluminum baking pan. Then bake the components according to the package directions. In this case, it's half an hour at 275 degrees. Really soon after they come out of the oven, you'll want to dislodge the pieces that were on the tile directly with a plastic implement because they come off easier when hot. Back in the studio, it's time to start with the ink washes. I'm using the Ranger Adirondack alcohol ink, which you can buy individually or in packages of three. Any alcohol ink probably works. You want to get your hand right in front of the camera so nobody can see what you're doing and then dab one or two drops of the color onto a brush. Use the brush to fill in large sections of color. I have a brush for each of the color families that I work with, but honestly, if you clean the brush in clear alcohol between colors, you can use just a single brush for this. If you end up with a harsh line, grab a spray bottle of rubbing al alcohol and just give it a squirt. This is similar to how we used water to squirt the Lumiere paints to spread the color and aid blending. If there are natural lines on your piece, you can use them as borders for deciding where to blend colors. That spray of alcohol really helps to blend softly. I like to use similar colors for depth and opposing colors for contrast. I'm not sure that using the different colors was necessary, but I wanted to see what would happen. You could probably just quickly coat these with one layer of the Perfect Pearls and it would come out beautifully because the, the, the alcohol ink doesn't interact so much with the color of the mica powder so much as the glitter. Fill in all the pieces with whatever colors you want in whatever combination you want. Uh, and when the ink dries, the shine is unbelievably pretty. I mean, come on, just look at that. Give the pieces a couple of coats of PYM2, which is the only spray coat that will work on polymer clay, and you're done. That's it for today. Check the blog for a few more details and 
As always, thanks for watching and stay creative.